This podcast is sponsored by Active Skin Repair, a skin health company helping people heal with natural, non-toxic, medical-grade ingredients. So, Bree, I remember this one time I was in a bike race around Tucson, and uh, I wasn't paying attention. We were riding down 4th Avenue, and there's railroad tracks, like streetcar tracks, and my bike's tire, like, went and wedged in to the railroad tracks, no. and I totally fell down and just, like, skinned my hands, everything. Ugh. I had nothing with me, nothing at all. And it's that times where you want a first aid product and you have nothing. And (laughs) active skin repair utilizes a molecule called hypochlorous acid. When applied to the skin, the molecule works by mimicking the natural immune response to cleanse, soothe irritation, reduce inflammation, and support healing. I've used it on my son's mosquito bites, and I wish I would have had it the time I totally scraped up my hands. Oh, I hear you. Like whenever I go paddleboarding, kayaking, I'm always trying to find something that is like an all-in-one that I can take with me. And active skin repair could be used like that. It can be used to treat cuts, scrapes, burns, sunburns, rashes, and other types of skin damage. It's also safe and non-toxic, which makes it suitable for all skin types, all parts of the body, like eczema and acne-prone skin, all of that. With over 500,000 happy customers, thousands of five-star reviews, and ingredients so safe and clean they can be used from the youngest member of the family to the oldest, you now have one simple solution for all of your family's skin health needs. Visit www.activeskinrepair.com to learn more about Active Skin Repair and to get 20% off your order. Use code NOGUILT. You can diet as much as you want, but your body is never going to look just like the other person's that you're probably idealizing. It's all about accepting exactly who you are and what uniqueness you have because I feel like we've been fed this lie that you have to all be thin. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. I am your host, Joanne Crone, joined here by the lovely Brie Tucker. Why, hello, hello, everybody. How are you? I'm really excited to get into our podcast episode today because we are going to talk about diet culture. We're going to talk about fat. We're going to talk about everything about our bodies, and I am so so passionate about this when it comes to women and their bodies, because I think it's one of the main things that is holding us back from living like this wonderful, joyous life is our stupid preoccupation with thinness in our society. Well, yeah. I mean, and and let's also give a nod to our our culture that we had growing up. We grew up in the 90s with the Kate Moss and yeah. the like stick thin there is no curves allowed culture. And let me tell you, as someone that comes with a naturally hourglass figure, I was actually bullied a lot in high school for like my figure. And there is nothing I could do about it, man. As many girls are, like girls' bodies are weaponized against them from the time they start developing as a teenager. Yeah. I mean, we see it in school dress codes where girls aren't allowed to show a bra strap or like they get sent to the office for quote inappropriate clothing because it's too like busty and maybe it shows a little bit of like cleavage like that's a bad thing and it's been we've been so conditioned to think it's a bad thing that I'm sure you're listening to it right now and be like oh that's inappropriate but really is it inappropriate and like why is it inappropriate my daughter actually was just talking about they do student council elections mm mm-hmm. And they do videos for their student council election. And the student council advisor, who is a woman, called out across the classroom to this girl who was running for class president. And she's like, hey, your video is inappropriate and you need to do it over. And the only thing in it that she called inappropriate was this girl was in a swimsuit in her video, whereas... The boys who were running in years past didn't get called out for wearing a swimsuit in their video. Only the girl did, which I think is really, really telling about what we think about females' bodies. It is. In our culture. Oh, my God. So is. It so is. So we – okay. All right. So, like, I – we are going to be fighting a lot of things on this uh, this episode, pushing back on a lot of things and really digging deep because – This is our Mother's Day gift to you, to release you. We are releasing you from all those years of damage you had growing up. Yeah, we want to tell you that you are the new hotness. Yes. You're hot. You're a hot 
just the way you are. And we can't wait to get into it. So before we start, if you know another mom struggling right now with thinking that she is fat and thinking that fat's a bad thing, by the way, we're going to talk about that some more too. Please share this episode with her because everybody needs a boost in their life. And with that, let's get on with the show. You want mom life to be easier. That's our goal too. Our mission is to raise more self-sufficient and independent kids, and we're going to have fun doing it. We're going to help you delegate and step back. Each episode, we'll tackle strategies for positive discipline, making our kids more responsible, and making our lives better in the process. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom Podcast. So I follow Jamila Jamil on Instagram and Jamila Jamil, she played Tahani in The Good Place, which mm-hmm. is how I first became aware of her. And she was always like, I noticed her body in The Good Place. I mean, it's something that you just, you notice in people. I noticed that she wasn't the typical body type in Hollywood, the stick thin, like she actually had curves. She had a shape and I thought that was really cool. And I also thought she was stunningly beautiful. Agreed. And so she posts, oh, yeah, stunningly beautiful. She posts on um, social media about how, you know, she had a recent weight loss and everyone's like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe like you lost weight. You look fantastic. And she's like, guys, no, you don't understand. Like at this weight I am right now, like I am filled with anxiety. I am not doing well mentally. And then she compared it to a picture of her that was looking less like than the body type ideal where her legs were thicker, like. You could see like rolls on her stomach. And she's like, in this picture, I was socializing with people. I was having fun. I was laughing. I was joyous. I was all of these things. And yet this skinny picture is what is praised in my life. And this picture of where I was totally happy is not. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that happens a lot. It happens a lot. I mean, I'm I'm guilty of it too, thinking like, oh, if only I can get to a certain size, then I could go wear this swimsuit and I'll feel happy. Like, have you felt that? Oh, ever? God, yes. Like, well, and you've known me like over my life, my my weight has always been a fluctuating thing. Like, I'm not I'm not a tiny girl and because I I just very whatever you want to call it. And I'm trying to think like when you first met me, I was probably a size six and that was like a tiny size for me, but I was miserable. Remember, I would tell you stories about how like my, my ex-husband would like not want me to eat any sweets. And so I would hide in the laundry room and occasionally I'd steal like cookies because I was yeah. starving and I had to yeah. do it like, it, cause I felt shameful if I did anything that would cause any, any issues. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something that I have felt that like, oh, if I was just that size, I would be happy. But then I come back and I remind myself that, oh, no, I was quite miserable. I was counting calories every day for years. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt, too. Yeah. When I was even just as soon as last year, I was on this macro counting thing and I could not stop thinking about food. I was watching on Netflix Sweet Magnolia's. And I couldn't even concentrate on work because I was so hungry. Like everything upset me and I, like my brain, I felt did not work right. And so I was binging sweet magnolias instead. And I saw a, like a plate of cake on there and I'm like, oh my God, if I could just have that cake, I would be happy. Yeah. And that's a warning sign. That's like a sign that, okay, something is not right in the head right here. If I can't focus on like actually contributing to society and I like my role here at No Guilt Mom, I I like I feel so good about it because I feel like I get to lift women up all the time. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. For all I wanted was cake. Yeah. Well, but all I wanted was cake. I couldn't even do that for other people. Yeah, but you couldn't even do it for yourself because you were in such a place. So, I mean... Yeah, we there is so much pressure on what you're supposed to look like. And then let's also throw in the whole mom bod thing. Like Mm -hmm. after you have kids, it is an insane amount of energy and effort that you have to put in. And then let's also add in getting older. 
Like I, Mm -hmm. everybody's body is different and their journey is different, but I got to tell you like 41 and up, my metabolism has decided it it went for a walk and I don't know when it's coming back. (laughs) It left for cigarettes and it never came back. It's I'm still waiting. (laughs) I'm still sitting on the front porch going metabolism, get your ass back over here. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. But you know why? It's only because like, I feel like I'm not where I should be. Yeah, that's the thing. And nobody feel telling. like you're not where you should be. Yeah, and nobody's directly saying that to me. Mm-mm. It's those messages from growing up that are still stuck in my head from the 90s and the 2000s and like and culture in general that like Yeah. Yeah. But here's the path many people take when they feel like they're not where they should be. They immediately go on a diet and they immediately start restricting their food and like do all these things that then make your mind like focused completely on food. I mean, that's what I did last year. I went on a diet. I'm like, oh, I'm not where I should be. I'm working out all the time. I'm not seeing the benefits. I'm going to I'm gonna go on a diet. I'm going to restrict all my, my food. And that is considered the acceptable solution. Whereas more questioning where did these beliefs even come from and are they even correct could be something that brings us better mental health. There's this wonderful book, Fat Talk, by Virginia Soul Smith. Virginia, I really want you on the podcast, by the way. Shout out to Virginia. We sent you a couple of emails. (laughs) There's so much good stuff in this book. Like, go get this book, Fat Talk. But one thing she says in particular is that the word fat isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially in the fat community. Fat is just, it's an objective. You're fat. Like, that's it. There's no shame. There's no emotions. There's nothing associated with it whatsoever. It's just describing a body type. Yeah. Which I found like really interesting when I was reading this book because it takes the stigma away from it. And there's so much other great stuff in the book as well, including like she goes into Michelle Obama's campaign during her time as first lady. And do you remember it was a let's move campaign? Yeah. Yeah. All about like promoting like healthy activity. Well, when you look at it, well, what was that healthy activity supposed to do? It was supposed to help kids get thinner. Like that's where it was supposed to do. It wasn't like geared toward heart benefits or anything like that. It was to fighting the obesity epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. And that was also considered an acceptable thing for a first lady to do because it was considered like a woman's thing that was appropriate to do because it was like body image and making yourself smaller. But there's all this stuff in it. And there's all of this stuff in our head that we then either limit ourselves or we pass down to our kids. And I found this out like from a very early age, I was affected by it. And I've told the story before, but it is about my struggle with bulimia. And I will get into it right after this. Hey, all it is Joanne and Brie here, and we want to tell you about a podcast that you should check out. It's called Understood Explains. This season of the show is hosted by teacher and special education expert Juliana Uturbe, and it's all about how to navigate individual education plans, also known as IEPs. And in this latest season of Understood Explains, it covers topics like how to tell if your child needs an IEP, and it busts common myths about special education. We actually just listened to the episode, IEPs, Does My Child Need an IEP? And here is what we loved about it. I loved that it was so digestible. Like it was such a short episode and all of the topics, which could be really confusing to parents, were easily explained. And I loved how they gave great concrete examples because you know how much I love me a good example. They explained what kind of services and supports you could actually see on a child's IEP or individual education plan. And they explained those acronyms that nothing drives me more crazy than when there's acronyms and I don't get it. I don't know what it stands for. They took the time to explain everything in so much detail and to cover concerns that a lot of families have about special ed services. To listen to Understood Explains, search for Understood Explains in your podcast app. That's Understood Explains, or just click on the link in our show notes. 
You have probably heard me talk about my dog, Addie, before. And when we first got her, we didn't know that she was a counter surfer. Now, counter surfing animals are the ones who jump on counters, especially kitchen counters, when you're not looking and take stuff off of them. Well, in this instance, Addie had jumped onto the kitchen counter and eaten an entire bottle of my other dog's pain medication. You can imagine the freak out that ensued from me. So imagine this. You're at the vet's office again, knowing that vet care costs continue to rise. You're anxiously waiting to hear how expensive the bill will be. But If you had pet insurance, your pet could be covered for accidents or illnesses. That's why you should check out ASPCA Pet Health Insurance. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program offers customizable accident and illness plans, making it easier for pet parents like you to help your pet get the care that they may need. They allow you to customize the plan, helping ensure that your pet's plan is as unique as they are. The ASPCA Pet Health Insurance Program has been around for over 18 years, and they've helped more than 600,000 pets during that time. Because vet bills can really add up, especially when you're least expecting it. It's simple. Use their app to submit a claim and you'll receive reimbursement for eligible vet bills directly into your bank account. To explore coverage, visit ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash no guilt. That's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash no guilt. Again, that's ASPCAPetInsurance.com slash no guilt. This is a paid advertisement. Insurance is underwritten by either Independence American Insurance Company or United States Fire Insurance Company and produced by PTZ Insurance Agency Limited. The ASPCA is not an insurer and is not engaged in the business of insurance. So I recently divulged to my parents that I was bulimic in high school. No one knew. Nobody knew at all. Like it was this lonely, lonely journey I had where I, you know, I felt, I mean, I felt alone in high school. I was a high school swimmer Mm -hmm. and swimming actually kept my weight down because Swimming is hardcore, man. But well, yeah, you so usually busy. have to replenish the calories some way you eat. Mm-hmm. And then when the swim season stops, you gain the weight back. And then swim season starts again in summer and it goes down and it's a vicious cycle. But I wanted to also act. I wanted to be on stage. And to feel like at the time, I'm like, well, actresses are thin. They're thin. Yeah. I need to control this somehow. And every effort I tried to restrict my eating didn't work. I've always been fine with exercise, but I would exercise and exercise and no weight would come off because that's not like how it happens. <laughs> Most of like the way your body's composed is, is what you eat. And I would get feeling so lonely and helpless. I would binge like a lot of food. Like I would come home and I would like clear out the leftovers and then I would feel so sick and shameful. It would all come up and like everything. And this happened for maybe a year or two, maybe two years. It was, I was really bad my senior year, like almost every day, many Mm -hmm. times a day. And I don't know what stopped it. I think I was just like, I read an article and I'm like, this isn't good long-term. You're like, oh, wait a minute. This, this, did you even, well, I'm curious because I feel like we all had things growing up. Did you know at the time that this was not good and that this was bulimia? Like, did you actually know? Okay. All right. Because I mean, like, oh, some, yeah. sometimes like, we don't even know. We're all like, oh, I came up with this, with this like, plan. Oh, no. Thing In I my do. messed up teenage mind, I'm like, oh, that seems like a great way to solve my problems. I still get to eat and I can keep my weight. Cool. And yeah. you know. Yeah. I knew it was a – I knew it – I mean, it wasn't considered a mental illness at that point. It was considered an eating disorder. Yeah. Which was, I feel like, not the same thing when we were in high school. Um, well, yeah. Because I was, was like, I'm 90s. fine mentally. Yeah. Very yeah, different. I'm fine mentally. It's an eating disorder. Eating disorders are cool. Everyone has eating exactly. Disorders. Let's talk about it everywhere. Oh my yeah. god! Everybody in high school, like, yeah, that's a that was a thing. We'd count our calories together at the at the high school lunch table. <laughs> yeah, I did know it was unsustainable, and so I knew that I probably needed to stop, okay. and I did eventually, and it just it kind of just went away. But it didn't become important to me again until Camden, my daughter, was born. And I looked at her and I'm like, I, I don't want her to have a mom who's ashamed of her own body. Yeah. Like I want her to grow up feeling really, really confident about her own body. And that is when I decided to feel good about it. 
And I, I ran marathons and I started eating like more veggies and more fruits and stuff like that. Not restricting so much as just replacing the quality of food that I ate so that I felt good about it. I did lose some weight in that time as well, just to be totally honest. But the eating disorder has popped up again and again. Like it's not popped up, but it's like, it, it's kind of like trickled Revisits. up. Like I'm not bulimic anymore. I don't do those things, but I'll see it in the ways I think about food. I'll see it in the ways like when I was dieting last year, I was very concerned about what I ate. Very, very concerned. I'm like, oh, can I eat this? Oh, let me like just make sure I weigh this right here. Oh, okay. How many calories do I have left in the day? How many is this? Oh, let me get this food. Oh, this food isn't as good. Like my entire thoughts are preoccupied with it. And after a few months of that, I'm like, this, mm, no, this isn't good. And I'm not showing a good example for my kids either in the way I'm doing this. And so that's when I decided there is no more dieting, nothing like that. I'm just going to let, let it fall as it may and see where we are from there. It's scary because I don't want my kids to deal with the same thing I did. None of us do. I don't want to pass that down. Yeah, we always want our kids to be in a better place than we were, to be better off than we are or were mm -hmm. are however it is like that's a parenting thing that I think every parent that I have ever met that is a goal that we all have we want our kids yeah. to be better than we were or to have more than we had be it more happiness be it less like we want them to be more fulfilled we don't want them to be not, tortured the way we were not have the weight your weight define you yeah because I think that's what we were told that our weight defines us and now that my daughter's in high school, like she tells me stories of behavior she sees her friends do, commenting on things like, oh my gosh, I ate so much today. Oh, I had this little rice cake. It's so much food. I just can't eat anymore. And then they turn to her and they're like, how can you eat so much? And she's like, mom, this is like making me feel like crap, like that I shouldn't be eating so much. And yeah. I'm like, I, you know, I'm so glad that you're aware of that, that this makes you feel that way. Like, let's keep talking about that. Keep seeing how it goes because it's not good. Yeah. It's not good at all. It goes down a really, really hard path where if girls are only focusing on their bodies and how they look, they have no room to focus on other things. I can say that from experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also like letting, comparing yourself to other people is not fair either because Everybody is different on what they have going on in their lives and how their body is made up. So like mm -hmm. even so so even if you let, let's just take you and me, right? Like I am five, I like to say I'm five eight. I'm like five seven and three quarters. So we'll round that up to five eight. And I'm currently about 176. My my happiest weight is like 160-ish. So I'm a little bit more than where I want to be right now, but I'm also not in a, a terrible, terrible place. But if you and I were to be the exact same weight, it wouldn't look the same on the two of us. Like mm -hmm. everybody is different. And that's like just this thing that I think everybody kind of just sort of needs to realize. Like you can, especially for our our kids, like you could diet as much as you want. And same for us too. You can diet as much as you want, but your body is never going to look just like the other person's that you're probably idealizing. It's all about accepting exactly who you are and what uniqueness you have because I feel like we've been fed this lie that you have to all be thin. <laughs> Else, no one will love you. That's the thing. That is true. And I actually, like, I do remember, like, so and it, it affects everybody. It does affect men and women, too. Like, so, like, another thing that oh, I yeah. saw it happen a lot was with my ex-husband. His mom had a lot of like weight and diet culture going on with her when he was growing up and it affected him very seriously. So much so that like he would go through some eating disorder types like where he wouldn't eat because he was afraid of the yeah. weight and he would flat out say like, I'm afraid of becoming overweight like my my mom's side of the family. Like I'm afraid of having that happen. And so much so that like sometimes he would even put it on me of like, one time I went through and I lost some weight like in my 30s or whatever because I had had two kids back to back and I had bed rest with one. So I had a lot of weight gain on my pregnancies because I wasn't I had restricted movement and everything. And again, they were back to back. So once I finally lost some of the baby weight, we were it was our anniversary. We were out somewhere and he's like, I'm so glad that you lost that weight because I was going to tell you if you couldn't lose it, we we're going to have to like think about separating because I just can't have somebody that has I'm not going to go through watching you go through what my mom did. He's like, I'm not doing it. 
He's like, guys, I won't. if you could see my eyes be <laughs> so wide right now. I remember and being like, to go through I, and go f- hunt him down. I remember being <laughs> yeah. like very like off put by that statement, but at the same time, I did understand this deeper trauma that he had from what yeah. he went through. And he is like, and I would tell you, like he in that moment, he was terrified of weight gain and what that meant, both for mm. him and for me. And like he was putting his trauma onto me in that moment. And that's a whole nother conversation. But I mean, like that, it affects people. And like, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. And what we're trying to get at is that like what we exhibit to our children, our relationship with our bodies and with Mm -hmm. food, they are watching and they pick it up. And it has a long lasting effect on them going forward. Oh my gosh. And I have a total mic drop moment onto how fat affects people and why right after this. Hey there, I'm Debbie Reber, the founder of Tilt Parenting and the author of the book, Differently Wired. The mission of Tilt is to change the way neurodivergence, whether that's having a learning disability, having ADHD, being gifted, autistic, or some combination of all of the above, is perceived and experienced so differently wired kids and the parents like us raising them can truly thrive. On the Tilt Parenting Podcast, I get to talk with authors, therapists, educators, and parenting experts who are committed to this mission. I ask the questions my listeners are most curious about when it comes to supporting our kids. And in turn, my guests share strategies for challenges, out-of-the-box ideas for navigating school, best practices for therapies, tips for advocating, and so many thoughtful insights on what it really takes to help our kids grow up feeling seen and respected so they can create awesome lives for themselves. I know that raising a differently wired kid can feel overwhelming and isolating, but I promise you, you are not alone and it can feel so much better. If you're on this parenting journey, come listen to Tilt Parenting. Together, we can shift this paradigm and show up for our exceptional kids with hope, possibility, and joy. When it comes to raising kids, there's so much to consider. Things like, what do we feed them? When do we feed them? How do they sleep? What does it look like to raise kind kids? How does their nervous system work? How do I keep myself calm? What are my triggers? There's so much that comes into play. And we are distilling all of that information for you at Voices of Your Village podcast, where we bring experts in the field of early childhood and education and psychology and across the board so that you don't have to comb the internet for information. You get to show up and hang out and have shame-free, judgment-free conversations and insights into what it looks like to raise kind, empathetic, emotionally intelligent humans. I'm Alyssa Blask Campbell. I have a master's degree in early childhood education. I'm a mom of two, and I am walking this journey right alongside you doing this work. Come hang out with me at Voices of Your Village, and we can dive into real conversations with actionable tips. So this is mentioned in the book Fat Talk by Virginia Soul Smith. And this was a like a mic drop moment, if you will. This whole idea that fat people are unhappier and that they have more stress in their lives being fat. And then it's like, oh, you should lose weight because you could like lower your blood pressure and you could have all these whole all health benefits. In fact, like many doctors, it's a problem in the fat community because if you come in with like short of breath and like heart palpitations, the first thing a doctor is going to tell you is you need to lose weight. Yep. And they will not do the testing to see if you have another underlying condition, which is huge. And one thing that actually may be contributing to this higher blood pressure, this higher anxiety, this higher stress level on fat people is the stigma of being fat. It is the social isolation. It is the disapproval from the rest of society and the comments on their body and this feeling that they are not enough as they are, that they have to lose weight. It is actually the stigma of weight versus the actual physical effects of weight on the body. And I was like, oh my gosh, totally. It's totally the case because it's been shown in study after study that most cases where people are like called overweight by their doctor, the weight actually isn't what's affecting them at all. It's this societal stigma. It's this never being enough. It's this always thinking about food. It's this like social rejection 
that they're getting, Mm -hmm. that's the cause of their stress, not the physical effects of the weight. And I was like, whoa. So I think about your ex-husband. Like he obviously had stress and his mom had stress, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't the actual weight. It was the outside world's perception of the weight and the stress that it caused. Yes, it 100% was. Like that was a huge thing. I mean, there was a small factor in there of the whole like type 2 diabetes and heart conditions. But he would even tell you that was a secondary thought. It had so much. And I can tell you now, like I I hear stories from my daughter where they'll be like, you you can't eat that. You're Oh, well, she got, okay, her first job. Oh. Was at Dairy Queen. She just started working this past year. So she hasn't even been working for a year yet. First job was at Dairy Queen. And then she moved into another dessert oriented job. She's at a gelato shop now. But she says that like her dad repeatedly will point out to her, like, you better not be eating there. Like, you better not be getting fat. Because if you eat there all the time, you're going to get fat. Oh, my God. And I'm like, dude, lay off on her. She's 15 and she's basically a bird because she doesn't eat much at That's a whole nother thing that I try not to focus too much on. Like she doesn't have heavy eating habits. And I know that, you know, you're not supposed to focus on that a whole lot. No. But you also like, yeah, yeah. This whole thought process. I don't even know where I went. Now I'm all blind with the whole like telling her that she. It's gonna get weird. You're like blind with rage. I'd be blind with I'm rage blind too. With the annoyance of the impact that has, and him it's not noticing what it does. And I think part of it too is like a male female thing, because I do think that men do not get as much judgment for not having the perfect ideal body as women do. Well, yeah, and they also have different like metabolic states. Yeah. Elise Lunin, who we're having on the podcast, I'm so excited. She writes in her book about how the seven deadly sins have an impact on how women behave. And so in the chapter about, what is it? Gluttony. Mm -hmm. She talks about this little arrangement her dad and her mom have with each other where they didn't want to, quote unquote, get fat in their older age. Hmm. So they each had, I know, I know. She she says, I know too. Like. (laughs) And so they made this deal with each other that if they were both near their goal weights every January 1st, that would allow them to spend like their allowance that they had for like fun things throughout the year. So they had to work throughout the year to make sure they were at their goal weights on January 1st. And her dad goes through this so easily and is like, yeah, I haven't gained a pound. I have such good self-control. And she looks at him and he eats like burgers and fries and he doesn't really change his eating habits whatsoever. And then She looks at her mom and her mom is like totally restricting everything she eats, like really stressing about it and is doing the utmost possible to make this goal weight every year. And her mom does. But to see the difference between the two and to have her dad have a higher opinion of himself because Mm. it's so easy for him. And why doesn't everyone else find it this easy? Like they must be totally lazy sitting around. And eating like 20 yep. pizzas at a time. Because look at me. I eat burgers and fries and I'm fine. Yeah. It's just different for everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's like, so like, again, like you can't compare the two. So there is one thing you talked about that I want to like definitely dive into here. You, when we were talking about this episode about the new hotness, I wanted to talk yeah. a little bit more about that. You got that from like burnout, but like, tell me more about the new hotness and it is how just I can apply this. That hotness exists in every single body and in every single person. And I love now, actually, my daughter has more representations of healthy body types now than I feel like we had when we were growing up. Yeah. Like there are Instagram influencers that she follows just because of their body consciousness and their body love that they have for their, you know, unthin bodies. Shout out to some positive sides of our social media there. If you you can navigate it now, we're not saying it's easy, but you can navigate it and you can find what you're, what can be positive and healthy for you. Yeah. Like I've stopped following people who like make me feel like crap about my body. Like anyone who is focused on dieting, anyone who's like not focused on like enjoying life, I unfollow. And I really enjoy following Jamila Jamil because she's very, very positive and very open about her struggles with it. Ashley Graham is a great person to follow. If you want to see hot, Ashley Graham is like definite hot. So when you think about the new hotness, you're just reframing what is hot. 
And if you see all these people like Lizzo, hot, like so many people who don't have that body type who are gorgeous. And that's what we refer to as the new hotness. So instead of like going into a dressing room and totally saying like, oh my gosh, my stomach rolls are so awful. (laughs) You're like, stomach rolls, those are the new hotness. And you just stand there and it's a silly thing, but it does such wonders for your mental health because it's saying that your body is perfect the way it is Mm -hmm. and you are hot and lovable the way you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really an important message that our kids need to hear us say, because I think a lot of times they do hear us say negative things about our bodies and there's nothing that makes me feel worse than when I do say something negative and my kids start to defend me to me. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I'm like, oh, because that's when I know I've gone too far because they're defending me to myself. Like I just I. Mm, OK, I need to really like shift my thought on this. Because, again, another thing I'm seeing with having a child that's going through, I, I can't, I, my, my son isn't as vocal about this, so I'm not going to like weigh in on him as much. But my daughter will be vocal about the fact that she's got genes that come from my and her dad's side of the family. Like, first of all, she's petite, which all the women on my side of the family are petite with the exception of me. And then like on my ex-husband's side, her dad's side. They're all like petite as well. And then she, but she also has the joy of the curves of our body on my side of the family. We are an hourglass shaped family and she is embracing the love of her butt and her thighs. And I love that because I, oh yeah, hated them growing up. I absolutely, it's like, we we even went jean shopping recently. She's like, jean shopping is so hard, mom. And I'm like, I get it. Like, Some people have no issues with it. For people with a round butt like us, like nothing ever fits. There's always that huge gap in the back. Like it is, it is so hard to find stuff. And like, and learning that, learning that at a young age, that that, that's not your fault, that that's actually a positive. Like you said, it's the new hotness. Mm -hmm. That's a real, that's a, hopefully will be a real game changer. I love it. We just started powerlifting as a family. And my daughter will go in and like squat and she's like, do I have a big yacht yet? (laughs) That's her goal. She wants a big yacht. Yeah. And she will kill me if she ever hears this podcast episode. So, (laughs) but I love that. I love it so much. Like it's so much more positive and attainable than that stick thin image that we were sold in the 90s. So like it's going in a great direction but it's also do I think we still have work yes yeah <laughs> yeah but it's also like and like we already talked about like every body type is different so embracing it like okay so we're giving examples of like where we were feeling overweight and trying to but there's the same thing with I know like with other people that are like like my my oldest my my stepson like he struggles to gain weight mm-hmm. and he beats himself up on not being able to gain enough weight yeah. And like, and so again, it's about embracing what you have and like, and realizing, like you said too, about like trying to be thoughtful and nourishing our body in a good way, but mm-hmm. not beating ourselves up for like, I love Oreo cakesters and that may not be part of my like low sugar, low carb diet, but I'm going to let myself still love them. I'm going to still love oh, them because yeah. they have a, there's yes. a time and a place for them. There is. And it's fine. There is. I love ice cream. I'm like the biggest ice cream fan. I'm also the biggest ice cream connoisseur, by the way. So it's not any ice cream. So like and people coffee. will get me ice cream. And I'm like, mm, this is not worth my time. Like, yes, <laughs> that is specific true. Specific stuff. That like, is true. Oh my gosh. The Magnum double caramel bars. Those are speaking my language. Like, they're <laughs> so good. So good. And like any artisanal ice cream that you go to, but I'm very, very picky. But when oh, I find sh- the ice cream, I love it. Shout I out to Salt and so Straw much. if you're listening. Salt you're coming, and straw. You're coming to Gilbert and, uh, you know, hey. I will be there. Joanne is happy to be a spokesperson. <laughs> I will be there. I will be there in line getting Salt and Straw because I love it so, so much. So our gift to you this Mother's Day, because this episode is is airing up for Mother's Day, if you're listening to it right when it dropped. And if you're not, it's totally fine. It's our gift to you all year long. You are the new hotness. 
Mm-hmm. You don't have to let diet culture like and all of that ideal whatever define you. That is not no. who you are. You are an amazing, badass, sexy mama the way you are. You don't have to wait to lose weight to do something that you want to do and to make the life that you want. The yeah. life that you want does not come from being thin. It comes from being you. And you're great just the way you are. So happy Mother's Day to you. We hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful time. And until next time, remember, the best mom's a happy mom. Take care of you. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for stopping by. Well, hey there, Busy Mama. Are you looking for ways to make your life easier, your home less chaotic, and at the same time, add more joy to your life? My name is Deanna Yates, and I'm the host of Wanna Be Clutter Free, a podcast all about letting go of the stuff we don't need in our lives so that we can focus on what truly matters. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you to throw it all away or make you feel guilty about keeping something you love, no matter how many other people don't quite understand it but I will give you practical and more importantly, actionable advice so that you can make progress right away. And you won't just hear it from me. There are amazing guests too. It's like having your bestie in your pocket, telling you it's okay to let go of the things that are not serving you and your family in a totally non-judgmental way. So join me over on the podcast where we can work on progress over perfection for those of us that want to be clutter-free.